Hi, everybody. How's it going? It's me, Lucius. And today I am with Mr. Bradley Voorhees, uh, founder of Sonic Gravity. So be prepared. We're about to orbit through Sonic Gravity. He has... has developed um, or has been working on a theory in physics and anti-gravity technologies and submitted to Kurt Jai Mungle's Theory of Everything Challenge and was awarded honorable mention. So congratulations on all the work you're doing, you. sir. Yeah. Thank you. I find it extremely fascinating. And the fact that you've already started building technologies that have shown results, even more fascinating. So. Hey, thanks. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's kind of a character fly I have, you know, I'm a uh, hypermanic is what my shrink says and it it means that like when you i don't know whenever i get something sort of i don't know, triggers me or whatever my brain starts spinning up really fast and it's hard for me to let it go and it's really it's tied with bipolarity so then once i get really really smart you know then i like come down i could get low so it's it's definitely not uh it's not it's not great but it's i don't know i mean once you once you're self-aware that you're neurodivergent and you have something like that you know what i mean like it helps but you but it's um but, yeah and you know because because like i you know i was i was talking to my shrink a little while ago and i was like you know i was like you know i'm about ready to submit this thing to darpa and and uh but you know i it, it, there are a lot of implications there like you're talking about we can talk about later but we're talking about like free clean totally renewable energy um anti-gravity uh you know everything that you need to make a ufo fly um and it, it really once you have quantum gravity once you have sort of the geometry of that it gives you dark matter it gives you quantum entanglement it gives you everything and so and i told my shrink that and a shrink like my shrink is a psychiatrist right so he's a doc he's a doctor and and he's so he's really smart and i was like but here's the thing is i know i know i fit the profile right like you know delusional like i i could be delusional right like i think i've uncovered anti-gravity i think i've done this i think i've done that and he's like well he goes you're right right you're right he goes you that would fit the profile he goes he goes but here's the thing he's like you figure out how to track and kill Sarah harris with their cell phone metadata didn't you i mean invented pattern of life targeting when you're in afghanistan i was like yeah i did and he's like well you invented an algorithm that peels up fraud networks and bulk transaction data when you're working for the sec right yep yeah blew up this dubavoy case from 30 million to 133 million it's usv d-u-b-o-v-o-y so yeah i invented it in november 2015 the case was filed i didn't even know about it in august 2015 and then it blew the case up and so the sec had to refile and replete and refile and replete and in january february march and april and it blew this case up to 133 million from 33 so it's an algorithm that peels up fraud networks and transaction data he goes you figured that out right i said yeah, I figured that out. He goes, well, he goes, here's the thing. He said, if I were a betting man, Brad, he goes, my money's right. on you. And so, so I was like, you know what? Yeah, that's right. I mean, maybe it fits the profile, but it makes perfect sense. And every time I explain it, people were like, yeah, that makes sense. So, I mean, we'll see. And I'm this close. I have already built it. The only thing I need to do, the reason I need funding is because, do you have the picture of it? Can you show the picture of it? Of the uh, device? Is that what we're talking about? Yeah, of the VAG, the Voorhees anti-gravity engine. That's the Mark 7. Let's get there real quick. Ah, and what yeah. it is, right is it's a Faraday disk. There you go. So underneath of that composite plate is a Faraday disk, essentially a copper disk <clears throat> of sorts that spins and it has magnets around the side, right? And so the magnets kind of push the electrons into the middle which makes it like a battery, right? On the outside of the disc, it's more plus because electrons are pushed to the middle from the magnets. And so it's minus in the middle and plus on the edges. And that makes it like a battery, like a minus and plus side of a battery. If you connect that minus and plus side and make a circuit, then electricity will flow. It's just physics. It's just what a Faraday disc, it's what it does. This is 200 years old tech. It's not controversial or experimental or anything. So there's a motor that spins this disc through these magnet frames, 
pushes the electrons in the middle. I connect it, create a current. And anytime you have a current in, um, you know, circuits, electricity, physics, anytime you have a flowing electric current, it creates an electromagnetic field. It just does. But the beautiful thing about a Faraday disk is the field blows through the surface of the disk, comes back around and comes in the other side. So the Faraday disks gives you this sick geometry of a field. Like a torus. Like, yeah, exactly. Like a donut, right? So right. Yeah. essentially blows up and comes down. And so, but what you'll see from some of the research is, is that when a magnetic field blows through, this is the Dr. Lawrence E's research, when it blows through a hexagonal atomic structure like graphene, where it's just a hexagonal lattice, then it teases out these what's called left-handed electrons, these left-handed chiral electrons. And the special thing that happens, and I don't know why, and Dr. Eves doesn't say why, he just says it does, is that these left-handed chiral electrons sit in a cyclotron orbit inside the field. They just sit there, which is beautiful, right? So, and the reason it's beautiful is because in the other video that I gave you, which was... I think from like 2012 or something, the Higgs mechanism, Dr. Matt O'Dowd tells us that the left-handed electron is stuck to the Higgs field. Right. It's, it, it's pull, it's essentially the Higgs field is pulling on the left-handed electron. And that means the left-handed electron is pushing on the Higgs field. Um, you know, thanks, you know, Newton's third law. So equal and opposite reaction, right? So if the Higgs field is pulling on the electron, the electron is pushing on the Higgs field. So my theory is, is that the Higgs field is a gravity field. And all of science thinks that the Higgs field is this kind of non-zero in the vacuum kind of buzz of a field that has 246 gig electron volts essentially everywhere. But I don't think it's 246. I think it's negative 246. And so I fill this magnetic field with these left-handed electrons. And then I have an oscilloscope attached to it. And then I pump that field. I shake them. Because if you shake something, you put energy into it. It's just like food in a microwave. I don't know if you know this or not, but when like you put food in your microwave oven and you turn it on, microwaves start beaming and hitting the little molecules of your food. They hit, they bounce off, and your food shakes. And that's what heat is. If they shake too much, they break off, release some energy, and that's what burning is, right? Yeah. And so, so when you excite these left-handed electrons that I'm catching in this magnetic field, they're holding on to the Higgs field. And if I'm right, that the Higgs field is negative 246, just like cooking your food in the microwave. If I shake 246 gig electron volts into the field that way, then the field value drops to zero. And right. everything in the field has to be massless then. Because again, in that Dr. Matt O'Dowd's PBS Space Time episode I sent you, it, if, if, um, if I'm right, and the Higgs field is a gravity field, and we drop the Higgs field to uh, zero energy then because the higgs field gives matter mass that means it can't give any mass to whatever's in the field and so you want me to open so up that's that how video? anti what's that you want me to open up that video yeah let's play it it's the pbs okay. space time video the higgs uh, mechanism so yeah. just so you know i've made up none of this all i did was go manic and teach myself quantum physics for about two months to sort it out. Now that's Dr. Lawrence Eves. He's the one who tells us that when you pass a magnetic field through a hexagonal molecular structure, it teases out those left-handed electrons. And so real quick, before, before, we get, before we get started, let me just tell you the evolution of my mind, how I figured it out. So I was listening to Kurt Jaimongal's Theories of Everything podcast, and in it, he interviewed Ross Colthart, who was the guy who interviewed Dave Grush and broke the biggest story in the whole world in the history of the humans on earth anyway well like you know humans that were sort of originally from earth so um so anyway the yeah no seriously i mean it though 100 but yeah. but he said that these craft take off at instantaneous velocity and you're an engineer i'm an engineer and you know that force equals mass times acceleration and so if you instantly accelerate right it's mathematically the exact same thing as going super fast and instantly decelerating, like crashing into something, right? The force that you generate is the same. It's inertia. It, it opposes motion, right? So, so if these vehicles took off like, you know, bullets instantaneously, 
they would it doesn't matter if they're drones it doesn't matter if anything they would crush themselves under their own inertia the same way they would crush if they hit a brick wall and stopped instantly unless mass is so, reduced to zero right right and so that's why they have to be massless right because if they're not massless they would crush themselves like a pop can when they took off well and that's also and so, my opinion, that's that's like the biggest hint what you just mentioned is the biggest hint that we live on the surface of a black hole almost too because Dude, it, I mean, it all goes together. I mean, like, don't even get me started. But yeah, for real, totally. Acceleration, you know, is the speed of light. And that's the accelerative force that we're existing within. So we're somewhat on the surface of a black hole. Well, that, I think you and I get to the same answer a different way. So, right. but it's like, it, yeah. I mean, so like time and space can't be fundamental. It's, um, I think energy and gravity is fundamental and space is the holographic surface of a black hole and time and space is just resolution on the black hole which means like the reason things that look smaller are for, are far away is because the light took longer to get to you from there so it's a lower resolution so it's just a smaller pixel and so so distance is just resolution on the hologram and if that's true, and if you think about it, if the universe is a hologram and we're perceiving in our consciousness is just perceiving quantum information, right? Then, then the whole universe is in the hologram right in front of you. Like the whole universe, it's just different resolution pixels. Yep. And so now remote viewing, I'm not trying to get into remote viewing, but, and I don't know anything about it, but if, if I'm right that the universe is a hologram, and I'm not the only one who thinks that, that's not consensus, but it's not fringe, right? Like Gerard de Hoof, and, you know, he won the Nobel Prize. You know, he thinks it's a, the universe is a hologram. That's, why, that's how he came up with sort of string theory, or that's kind of part of the string theory genesis. I don't pretend to understand all of it, but I know enough to, you know, have a beer and talk about it. Um but uh, but if it's true that the universe is a hologram, that's the only way to me remote viewing makes any sense. Because I agree, I agree with that. Because yeah. it's like the whole universe is right in front of you. You're just tuning your consciousness to look at smaller pixels, to look at you know more distant sort of like lower resolution pixels. I mean, because if the universe is a hologram and your consciousness is on it, and your consciousness is really essentially tuned to observe pixels that are essentially contemporaneous with you then it makes sense that's why we can only see so far that's why we can you know um you know only see things sort of in the past you can't see a bigger pixel than you right so you can't see the future but um and but everything you know pixels you know are constantly you know essentially falling into a lower resolution which is kind of what i interpret when i hear you talk about one half past and one half future things are you know getting smaller as they go into the past but if you can tune your consciousness to a different resolution, then you can see things further away or yep. things that are in the past. Maybe even see the future if you can tune your consciousness to see sort of bigger than where you're at. And so anyway, I mean, I don't know exactly how any of that works. I just know that if I'm right about the universe, that it seems plausible. You know what I mean? Was so, there a certain section of this video you want me to show? Um. Yeah, yeah. So um, he... He goes to maybe maybe head back to that first second line right there. This yeah, line. right there. It, it, a little bit further back, about two. Yeah, wait. Okay, right there. Yeah, where it says quantum. No, no. Yeah, about one thirty. That's cool. But hey, real quick. So, so the whole evolution of how I figured out anti gravity is this: they have to be massless, or they would crush themselves under their own weight. Fact what causes and so then i'm like okay well what causes mass what what causes mass to happen and here dr o'dowd will tell you the higgs field causes mass to happen so uh, i'm not making any of this up this is what he says then he talks about the left-handed electron and how the left-handed electron is stuck to the higgs field and so then i'm like the next step was like okay well how do i grab left-handed electrons how do i get them and that's when i found dr lawrence eve's re research with graphene in in 2009 and i was like okay i need to create a magnetic field i need to pass it through a hexagonal molecular structure and that'll tease out these left-handed electrons for me and then all i got to do is shake them and if i'm right that the higgs field is the gravity field and if i'm because it's the only field that is a non-zero value in the vacuum right and so we know gravity crosses space right so what else is there right 
it's the it's the Higgs field that communicates that information that where the universe tells your matter how much how that it has mass. And so so that's that's how I came to the conclusion that look, this Higgs field must be the gravity field. And if that's the case, they say gravity is negative energy density. And the scientific consensus is under the misimpression that the non-zero value of the Higgs field is two positive 246 gig electron volts. It ain't positive 246 gig electron volts. It's negative 246 gig electron volts. So if I create a field with my Faraday disk, if I pack it full of left-handed electrons, and then I shake them and drop them to zero, I'm going to create an, an anti-gravity field, and everything in that field is zero mass, period. End of story, because if it's negative 246, if I shake 246 into it, it goes to zero. I drop it to the ground state and just created what you call symmetry break with the Higgs field. So that's the totally bonehead, simple. I mean, like I know some people will be like, dude, that's kind of over my head. That's cool. That's but but I think for an engineer like such as yourself and a lot of other folks that I've talked to, they're like, dude, that makes a lot of sense. You know, so, what I, mean? I mean, just to break it down for the layman real quick, basically, you create a toroid with your Faraday. Well, you yeah, okay, a donut of magnetism, yeah, a magnetic field, and then magnetic create, field donut. Then you create a filter, essentially, with um, hexagonal structures. Those plates, yep, those plates, those hexagonal, it's, and essentially, it's a, you know, essentially a bug catcher for those left-handed electrons, right? Exactly. It has so the magnetic have, field through it. You have the field going like it. this, and you put the filters yep. in it, so the filters basically catch the, the left-hand electrons. Yeah, and yeah. so if you show my, show my picture of my, the vag mark five yep let me get that up on so there. the best i can do off amazon when it comes I'm to sorry. hexagonal structures is plates of nickel and graphene that is a that is a nickel graphene sandwich and it's just how did, it's how did multi you get the graphene did you make that yourself no i just well i tried making it like you know you can sort of put oil and then like cook it off on a grill and it gives you it gives you a really thin layer of of graphene but like, don't catch your house on fire because that like oil is flammable. It's like a mess. I just bought a few hundred bucks worth of it off of the internet. What? And just an idea. This might be like a really dumb idea, but it might work. I've seen people. No, use, don't say like, that, um, dude. I mean, like, uh, if it's dumb, I'll tell you. Yeah, well, they get tape, right? And they put it on a piece of, of graphite. Yeah. And then they pull off the tape. Method, yeah. and now they have a thin layer of what they call graphene stuck to a piece of tape. So then, yep. couldn't you just melt the tape away and keep the graphene layer? I don't know. It's hard to say. Like, I'm not sure what the bonding of the glue is. Like, what happens if the glue melts? Does it swirl and disrupt the structure? You know I'm, I'm not really exactly. sure. So that, that's the, I, I don't uh, know. I don't really know. that. I mean, I probably – that would be a great <clears> – <throat> if I didn't get any funding, if nobody did it, I would probably spend years yeah. creating plates of, you know, essentially yeah. graphene tape, you know, and just – I mean, there's there's things I could do, I suppose, just like that. That's that'd be a great idea if I couldn't get funding. Um, but the funding, really, all I need the funding for is you see that plate right there. That's the sandwich layers. Can you see my is, mouse I need to, cursor? Yeah. Yep. So like this this plate up top is what you're talking about. Yep. 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 Underneath of it is a uh, is a sheet of graphene. Underneath that is another plate of nickel. Underneath that is another sheet. So it's like a sandwich. Now. What's really going to blow your mind, okay, and the reason it works, and you'll see from Dr. Lawrence Eve's <clears throat> research, is that it's a hexagonal atomic structure. Right. The lattice of atoms is a hexa hexagon. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, go ahead and pull up the To the Stars Academy um, purchase that um, um, Tom DeLong made. Now, this one, right? That was, that was a UFO fragment. I think that he said that people, had it for a while. Yep, I, she had yeah. ones like it. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> That's look, at the, look at the cross section. Look at the cross section. What do you see? Well, you see the different layering, right? Is what you're layers, talking about. Yeah, right. layers. And it's bismuth, magnesium, and zinc. Yep. And guess what the atomic structure of bismuth, magnesium, and zinc is? I think all of them hexagonal. They're all hexagons. They're all yeah. hexagonal. So it's like, dude, yeah, I have it. It's definitely. So then, I mean, ultimately, you need to run a, a magnetic field through that or a torus or something like that. Yep. So it starts to catch those electrons and then you need to shake them. Yep. That's it. Anti-gravity in a nutshell. There you go. And so the reason I want the DARPA funding and I have a colleague that I work with at the SEC who actually before he came to the SEC, he was working at the National Science Foundation 
And so he knows dudes in the National Science Foundation, their grants department. And he goes, if that whole thing doesn't work out with DARPA, he goes, you know, we're going to let's talk. And I was like, dude, no, let's talk now. So so uh, so there's also funding to be had with the NSF because and, and he's an engineer too and he's like man he's like i see it he says i totally see it he goes this is like nobel prize stuff he's like the nsf who just wants to put their name on something so they will throw money at you for this and i was like dude i'm i'm just telling you it's it's you know it's gonna work i mean i've already so what the, I've, yeah I've, oh, sorry. so yeah so all i need the money for is to essentially 3d print myself you know uh i call it an anti-gravity amp so it's like the amp that's on top of my um badge um except it's just going to be a classy high speed nano layered uh alloy like 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 tom's got here so you can make that in a, a clean lab though right if you just use sure. like the right yeah, like you, yeah. Sputtering just plate it, right? or something yeah you can spatter it or i think they can electro plate stuff you know i mean yeah. i don't i'm not an expert on that like you know whoever you know i'll pay somebody to to do that just tell them what i need you know and i'm sure they make it happen but that's I mean, what i need right there you could probably even yeah i used to work I, i've worked in a clean lab for a little bit and i was like making like computer chips and so you could do like a couple different processes is what i'm thinking like photolithographic re resin work um you know yeah. like all kinds of things yeah dude uh, like i mean i tell you what like if i get the money let's talk and you know see you know, we'll, we'll, uh, you, you can be the, you, you can be my sub well, that and, was one and you can <clears throat> give me that, uh, give me that material. You know what I need? So just make it happen. I'll pay for it. Yeah, no, I mean, that'd be great. But like what I'm seeing, um, with, with your model right here, clearly it's, it's bigger, it's more macro, right? So it's not, it's not as refined as the, the one over here. Um, but you were still able to get anti-gravity effects and you have it, you have it documented that you have yeah i do yeah it's on it's on uh it's 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 on my twitter it's it's on the sonic gravity facebook page um which i think i don't know if it was pulled or not um like i don't know somebody told facebook that i violated their policy or whatever i'm not sure i don't really even care um but it, it's hanging there um I'll, I'll i'll send it to you maybe hang it on my i'll hang it on maybe hang it on the sonic gravity website but yeah essentially um i can try to i can try to pull it up if you want i thought you um i thought you had it open we could um you could do a share screen and show us those two test results that you did yes let me uh i'll stop sharing this in one second i just had one more thing i wanted to say so basically i believe that sure. linda molson how also said that this um piece of material here gets anti-gravity effects when it was hit by a certain frequency laser i don't know if you heard that I no, I don't know. I don't think that's right. I don't think it's laser, but I think it's electromagnetic. Um, I think it's an electromagnetic field. Okay. A but harmonic a proper, electromagnetic field. A proper frequency though, right? Is what? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Well, and essentially you can think of like the yep. little left-handed electrons there that you're trying, essentially you're trying to shake energy into to drop exactly. the Higgs field to the ground state. Well, if when you think about it, like if you, if you push them, they're going to have what you call a natural frequency. You know, essentially, you push on it, it'll swing out and come back. And it's like, like a, a kid band. on a swing, right? Yeah, or a pendulum. Or, I, was, I was saying like a yeah, rubber exactly. band. Rubber exactly. Band bouncing back and forth. Or, and yeah. so the frequency, which I, I I believe is gravity wave frequency, you, you'll you push, and then it'll go out and come back. And you push, and it'll go out and come back. And that's called a harmonic loading, right? It's like where it's like... And you need to make sure that the harmonic loading matches... The frequency you need to load it at the same frequency the same exactly. like you know hertz it's as... like pushing a kid on a swing like you're saying like yep. you, don't you push can't the push kid. him when he's at the bottom or you'll right. screw it up you know what i mean right. if, if you want right to resonate it if you want to pack if you want to build energy in it you have to push only you know, when he comes right back to you then you push and you go out and come back if you push if you push off of that it's it's called resonance when the when the loading frequency matches essentially the system frequency Right. Because that means you push it, they go out, they come back, you push it, and you build that energy like you're pushing a kid on a swing. The amplitude increases, can... power increases, and it increases dramatically too because you're you're amplifying the, the yeah. effect ultimately. And, and and you can do it with very little energy if you hit that frequency right and you just keep building energy in the system and it, it will totally collapse. And that's what we're doing is we're 
technical terms, we're causing a symmetry break with the Higgs field. And so when the Higgs field has to let go of that mass, it lets go of the mass. And where does the mass go? It actually, I think it goes into the past. And that's um, why, because, sorry, I, I'm making ahead of ourselves, but you have a good theory on like where these UFOs are coming from too. Yeah, that's why it's us uh, in the future is because when it lets the energy go, when it lets that energy, because mass is energy, we'll, we'll, we'll get to Dr. O'Dowd in a second. But that it has to go somewhere. When the Higgs field lets go of it, where does it go? It goes into the past and it will go exactly. And I talk about in my theory of everything that I submitted to Kurt Jemungal's contest. Um, when it, it, it goes into the past, the tension, like gravity is caused by passing through the curvature of time. We can talk about that too. But essentially the tension in the Higgs field as it, as it, as it goes back in time has to perfectly balance, right? Because tension is negative energy density that's caused by the distance in time. And then, but it has to negative, it has to completely balance the energy of that mass. Because, so it stays back in time because what happens when you stop, it snaps right back most likely, right? Or Well, we're going through time. And so it's going through time too with us, but it will go as far back as it takes to completely balance that positive energy. So, because conservation mass energy, right? It has to be net energy zero in the time where it is. Because- the universe you can't you can't uh you can't create or destroy energy so you can't drop your mass 15 minutes ago because it will be essentially adding energy to that slice of cheese that instance of time in the universe right so it's like if every instant was like a frame in a movie reel if you chop all those frames out and stack them from the beginning of time to the end of time then tension across those that becomes time like right and so tension in the Higgs field has to totally balance that energy that you just dropped from the pat from the present. And it will go as far back as it takes to cancel that energy. And that's why we're seeing now. So imagine here is like, you know, you know, 2100 and yeah. here we are in 2023, right? When they're seeing when, you know, in 2200 or wherever, you know, they're zipping around in their massless craft. Well, like dingleberries, right at the end of the toilet paper, that's where their quantum echoes are, right? And so in 2023 here, we're looking up and we're seeing these weird shapes, right? You know, zip, kind of zipping around all massless and everything. And, um, and you know, um, Graves talked about at the congressional hearing, he's like, yeah, it's a square. It's a square in a weird field circle. And that's what I'm saying is, and you heard Grush, you know, he talks about holographic projections. Well, when you drop that mass into the past and you're looking at it, because essentially masslessness wrapped in gravity is Einstein's recipe for a, a wormhole, an ER wormhole, period. So I didn't make that up. That's Einstein. Take it up with him. It's 1921. Well, I think that's one of the theories that a lot of people say, too. It's that, well, maybe they're future humans. You hear a lot of people say that. Yeah, that's so why you can you see the them. behind it in a way. Yeah, you're seeing them through a wormhole and you're seeing them zip around, you know, and, and it's an ER wormhole. And so that's why I'm saying, and, you know, part of the reason that, you know, we hear, we, you know, at least earlier this year when the, the military was like, oh, we shot down a craft and we can't find it. Well, that's because you shot a wormhole. And if you put energy into a wormhole, it'll close it. Yep. So, or, I mean, or, or the bullet sticks, right. And then it's more massive. So it has to go further into the past. So, you know what I mean? To, to cancel. So, so it looks like it goes, poop, you know, and it just disappears, but it really just went probably further into the past. And you just shot you, um... a U.S. pilot probably. I don't know if you caught the my last show. I was speaking with Dr. Jim Segala, who has created these devices that measure like electromagnetic fluctuations, but also one of the things was gravitational fluctuations. And well, there's gravitational spikes whenever these UFOs basically come around. Um, and at the same yeah. time, after the gravitational spike goes, it snaps almost like perfectly back to where it was. So um, that's what he was saying that like our universe, our layer is very rigid in a sense. You can hit it. And it'll just bounce right back almost. So the second you turn off the device, it just snaps right back to the future relative to us. Yeah, it's called renormalization. Um, uh, that, that's exact. What it's called is renormalization. It's it's. Um, I learned that I was like watching something that Leonard Susskind, you know, and then I think also uh, Gerard de Hoof. Um, probably, I think published a lot on that. I mean, I, I don't really know. I'm not a physicist. Essentially, I taught myself the quantum physics I needed to know to sort out anti-gravity. That's it. So, so I'm not a physicist, you know, I mean, I am an engineer. I mean, I'm a pro registered professional engineer. Um, 
you know, I would in say a couple you're a theoretical days. physicist. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, theory. maybe, but I don't think it's that tough. I really don't. I don't think it's that tough. It's it, and I got there as an engineer problem solver, right? They yep. got to be massless. What causes mass? You know, okay. Um, left, you know, the Higgs field. How do I get a hold of the Higgs field? Left handed electrons. Okay. How do I get left handed electrons? Oh, past, you know, an electromagnetic field through, uh, you know, hexagonal atomic lattice, you know, okay. And then shake it, right? So, and that comes that whole shaken piece. And the only thing that's really, you know, not consensus, right, which would be fringe or novel is my un is my take that the Higgs field is negative 246 giga electron volts and my take that the Higgs field is the gravity field. But I think since there's like only one field that I know of, which is the Higgs field that has a non-zero value in the vacuum and we know gravity passes from suns to planets and planets to other planets and stuff, there's only one quantum field that can communicate that information. So if it's not the Higgs field, then I don't know. It, nobody knows what it could be. It might be a field so, that hasn't yet been found that could be related to all that. But at this point in time, it's most likely yeah. Higgs field, right? Like, pretty much. I'm mean, just working with what I got. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, and and if, but it wouldn't work if. But what I what I've done the the vages that I've created the Voorhees anti gravity engines that I've created, um, have, have proved that concept, and we can show it right now if you want. We can show the proof. Yeah, I'd like to, you, you, have, you have the two clips I think you, you were trying to send me earlier, but it wasn't working out, but you have them on your computer, right? I do. Let me try to, let me, uh, I got to hit a button right to share something. I think. Yeah, it should be on the very bottom. It should say share screen. Let me share. There Can we go. Can you see it? Yep, yep, I'm seeing it. Okay, so here's the very first result of the VAG1. Now, what I did was I took it, I, I took the VAG, I, it was about 50 pounds. I put it on a butcher's, 100 pound butcher scale, and then turned it on. And if it works, it'll get lighter. And what happened as the, as the Faraday disc is spinning, it's speeding up and it passes through. And, and right now, the, the, the Faraday disc in the VAG1 was essentially a hoop of spokes and so it didn't have an oscilloscope that was like pumping it like with a frequency it was essentially creating its own rhythm as the sort of bar magnets that those spokes were passing through were passing it was going like vip 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 vip, vip through a bunch of bar magnets and that was what was creating the harmonic field and so you can see that as it speeds up, it does what I think passing, passes through a harmonic frequency and you see it swing about 7% lighter, about like, you know, maybe as much as two and a half pounds or so. But also remember that the motor has cords on it and everything's sort of weighing it down. Um, and so it's actually losing more mass than that because as the scale gets lighter, it actually moves up, which like drags the cords up with it and stuff. So even though it looks like it's only losing, you know, two, two and a half pounds or something like that, it's actually losing a lot more because it's actually would take, it would take force to actually lift. You know what I mean? Right. So here we go. Crazy, right? 49 pounds and it swings light. Let's watch it one more time. All the way to 47 almost. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that something? Yeah. One more time. And so you have it rotating. Um, and that you said the mechanical frequency of 1.5 uh, kilohertz there. Yeah. And so if you just take like the distance it spins for a second, you know, and then yeah. um, the number of the number of ticks of, uh, you know, the number of ticks of the spokes, spokes going through exactly going okay. through that number of, of magnet bars. Yeah, that's where that comes from. Okay. So if you had more spokes, you could you would have a higher frequency based off of that concept, right? Yes, yes. But yeah, you would definitely you would change the frequency. If okay. you change the spacing of the magnets or the thickness of the spokes, you would change the frequency. Okay. So and then let's see if um so here's one, here's the VAG 
you see this one here's the here's the this is the mark IV, where it's got the the plates it's got um the oscilloscope and the oscilloscope creates a signal and the signal is run through a car stereo amp and that's what all those gold resistors are and the car stereo amp is what jacks up the wattage but it runs um a lot faster it sort of controls the frequency a little bit better and as you can see right here it's at about a hundred or i'm sorry it's about 71 and three quarters of a pound or about no i'm sorry 70 about 71 and a half pounds and it gets down to like 71 and i, my, I say 71.375 here but it it gets down hardcore it gets down to 71 so it's about a half a pound not like it's it's anyway bottom line is is the the starting rig weight was you know between 71 and a half and 71 and 3.75 but it gets down to 71. So you ready? And this one took a long time. So this one, it, it started out and then it started to come down. And I, I think in retrospect, what I should have did was while it was running to end this video, I should have turned it off so you could see it snap back up to 71 and a half pounds. I think that would have been gold. I wish I would have did that. But, right. um, but, but, I, but I, anyway, I just, I was freaking out when it, went to 71 so and i waited to see if it would go longer but anyway here it is you've lost about a half a half a pound with that one basically yeah yep and that's using in in a way like not i'm not trying to say it's simple or anything but using very simple layering of hexagonal structures not at like the the micro level you know you don't you don't have yeah. like a, a bismuth magnesium layer but no so no I, I mean like i need the funding to fabricate an alloy a yeah. bug catcher you know uh, i call it an anti-gravity amp or you call it a bug catcher I like bug but, I think it's more simple. It <laughs> makes sense, right? It just makes yeah. sense. And that's what, you know, it's not that technical. Like you hear guys like, you know, physicists trying to talk about it, like Jack Sarfati. He's like, oh, look, follow these equations. These equations are what, do nah, it's not equations, dude. Have it's you like, about, and you know. Uh, have you heard about like uh, the bug, the chitin? I, I forget what it's called, but it's like the bug shells have those hexagonal structures in them. And like people have. I like, know that. People have worked with like bug shells, beetle shells almost, um, to like layer them and create anti-gravity effects because they naturally have tiny little um, hex hexagonal structures. It it's, makes it's, sense. It's, it's reminding me of that. That's the reason I'm bringing it up. I don't know if it's the same or not, but it just reminds yeah, no, me. I don't know, man. It, I mean, but it makes sense. Carbon is graphene, right? So carbon-based life, Right. It, it wouldn't surprise me. You know, and they say all the time, like there's things that fly, they have no idea how they fly or why it happens. Yeah. I actually do. I actually have figured out like and i have an episode called consciousness or slow you know controlling the flow of time with consciousness but um it's because you know hummingbirds aren't really fast because they have fast muscles they're fast because their consciousness dilates it slows the flow of time um because consciousness is on the surface of black hole hawking proved or <clears throat> established that the energy on the surface of the black hole is finite so if space time is blown out of black holes and that's what changes the hologram and we know causes this universal expansion and just a minute <coughs> essentially space time's blown out of black holes which causes universal expansion and changes the hologram and that's what we notice is the passage of time if our consciousness is also on the holographic surface taking up some of that energy then it time has less energy to blow through and change the hologram because the energy is fixed and that's that's hawking that proved that the energy was fixed and that that's why black holes must evaporate because the energy must come from the black hole and of course i think hawking radiation is essentially our consciousness leaving the surface of the black hole when we die because information is contained in that heat and bodies go unnaturally cold 
when people die. I don't know if you know that or not. They don't like, it's not like, you know, if it's a hundred degrees outside and then your body's 98 degrees and you die, you actually get colder than 98. You don't, you don't go, you don't, your body doesn't go from 98 and just kind of, you know, equal, you know, equilibrate right. with a hundred. You, when you die, your body goes cold, colder than 98. I get what um, you're saying. That's, that's a weird thing. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't it know shouldn't that. happen. It yeah. shouldn't happen. And so I think it's because consciousness is Hawking radiation, a heat leaving the surface of the hologram. And so when that heat leaves the surface, it leaves our bodies colder. But um, but it's that also that body heat that is the energy that's pulled from the surface of the black hole. And when that heat is pulled from the surface of the black hole, time, space time blowing out of the surface of the black hole, which is what causes universal expansion. And if you look at the new neutrino map, because I the other part of my right. Uh, right. of my of my theory of everything is that space time blows out of black holes and so that's why nothing falls in but um but if you look at the new neutrino map it looks like bubbles it looks like bubbles of essentially expanding bubbles yeah which is neutrinos is i think is the marker the 3d voxel of space time and so it shows space time blowing out of where black holes are and if i'm right and they can disprove this there needs to be a black hole in the middle of every one of those bubbles. If that's true, then I'm right. Um, because that couldn't be random. And so, and so it's, it's the universe is the surface of a black hole. Space time's blowing out of it, which changes the hologram. But the amount of energy that our consciousness peels off the surface of the hologram, right? Leaves less for space, which means time moves slower. And, as a proxy for the sort of quantumly entangled feature of our existence that I think correlates to this time dilation is the neurons and sort of the energy firing from our neurons. Snapchat and rate. so, so the, yeah, so the human, the human brain is 53 million neurons per gram. So, but the neural density of brain matter for a hummingbird is like 650 million neurons per gram. So when they're conscious, their brains suck more energy off of the surface of the black hole, which leaves less energy for time to move. So they move faster because their clock is ticking slower. So when everything winds back and in proper time, they're moving a lot faster between their ticks because their ticks are going slower. And so that's why when you look at a hummingbird and it's beating its wings at 200 times a second, when it's a you know when it's flying around but when it's awake its heart beats 20 times a second and when it goes to sleep you know how fast the heartbeat one time a second just like ours but when it wakes up and its consciousness is pulling energy off the surface of the black hole its heartbeat not when it's flying but when it's awake its heartbeat speeds up to 20 times a second well that reminds and, me when people have like adrenaline rushes right and their brain now instead of just taking 20 frames a second is taking like 40 frames a second they go into that slow yep. thermal state so their brains yep. are really taking more pictures and time seems to slow down. Yeah, so 100%, the, man. Yeah, I think the snapshot rate is a huge thing when it comes to like the time dilations between dimensions or the time dilations that exist between perceptions. You know, that's... that's yes, 100%, time, man. Yeah. 100%. And a bumblebee? A bumblebee, like, look at a bumblebee, dude. A bumblebee is like the human equivalent of Chris Christie flapping trash can lids. Really. No, I've you know heard what I mean? that like, bumblebees shouldn't be able to fly. You know they shouldn't. Right. But guess how many neurons per gram their brain has? I could... Like two and a half or one and a half trillion, one point two trillion or something like that. How many times more is that than the human then? Fifty three million. Um, so it's twenty two hundred. I don't know about. I don't know, maybe like rough number. Two hundred twenty times. Yeah. Yeah. So two hundred twenty times. So. So, um, so what you have there is a situation where they're taking so much energy off it that their clock is ticking so slow that they're getting like, I mean, guess how fast, guess how many times, I mean, a bumblebee, um, a, a hummingbird has flaps its wings 200 times a second. A bumblebee can flap its wings 600 times a second, right. 600 times a second. If you had a machine that took a little you know, pinch held onto a bumblebee wing and did 600 times a second, you, it would snap in a second. The only way that they can flap their wings as if their time is literally slowed. And so, and so, but if you think about that, just think about what that means. You're talking about like the G forces on the wing itself, basically. Yeah. 
I mean, how yeah. the the only thing is it's you're it's just it's time is slowed. So, so you know, bumblebees have really fast muscles, right? They just have really slow time. But if you think about that, now the power of the human consciousness, can you imagine if you could activate many neurons in your brain as the bee does? You you could fly like Superman. I mean, everything would go so you would have super strength. You would be pushing on stuff at a at a cyclic rate. Like you could lift cars. It would be like everything was in water, right? You could you could you could swim through the air like you know well, at, now, at super now, speed. Now even, you'd, you'd have the speed of the of... flash i mean you literally have superpowers if you could if if i'm right if i'm right you know, that if the universe me. is holographic you, you get like now you have your a parent and your kids under distress and like now all of a sudden the mom has the strength to lift an entire car right because her brain is taking big, faster pictures she's in that slow gamma state her adrenaline's going she's I'm just theoretically like kind of spitballing with you here. Now she can lift. Dude, a car yeah. Because now the things that time. seem crazy that people say happen, you're giving and and we're not even trying, right? We're not even trying to justify the super mom who freaks out when she flips a Volkswagen because it's, you know, going to run over a kid or something. But you're actually putting physics, like legit physics, you know, to this particular explanation and if we live in a holographic universe and if consciousness is on the 2d holographic surface of a black hole and space-time is blowing out of that black hole which is causing universal expansion and space-time needs the energy that our brains use the same justification for stephen hawking saying that black holes evaporate well now i mean super moms you know bumblebees hummingbirds <laughs> and and remote viewing all kind of seem plausible you know what i mean so and you know and i came up with an experiment here's how you prove me wrong here is the proof here is the scientific proof that would disprove me take an analog timepiece right take an analog timepiece and i'm not even kidding this is going to sound crazy take a small analog clock right put one on a desk and then put one in your ass so that it's inside the body heat inside you your, your mouth? <laughs> yeah, you can put it in your mouth too, but I, you know, you might open your mouth and I don't want you to pollute the scientific results. So it might be better if you stuck it in your ass. I don't know. You can just anyway, it. bottom. You can swallow it like a pill. How about that? Oh, but then they'll say, Oh, it's the stomach acids that whatever I'm saying, just do something where nope. Argue. I mean, to put it underneath of your armpit too and just like cold your way but bottom line is is if that's true if we the clock that's inside you must run faster than the clock that's the control counter so the reason it does is because consciousness is the heat is being the surface of the black hole and space time doesn't have blown out of the black hole doesn't take advantage of the energy and so it's gonna it's gonna, it's gonna take tick slower for the clock that is inside this or something consciousness controlling the flow of time that's the episode i did that where i figured this out and i put it in, in a sonic gravity episode I said surgically implant it into a hummingbird. You could implant the clock in a hummingbird and then pull it out. And I raised this issue because I went to the University of Maryland and I talked to a couple of the physics there. And one physics prof threw me out of his office, said it's stupid, whatever. And I was like, all right. Well. And then I went and talked to another guy and talked to him about what I thought dark matter was. And he and I sat in his office for two hours. And his advice was, that makes a lot of sense. He said, but to make it something like this go in the scientific community, you would have to you know, do a paper and then you would have to, look, you know, and anyways, it's like a lot. And I was like, yeah, I was like, that's just not what I'm doing. I was like, I'm just doing casting, but I just wanted to talk to a really smart person and say, this is what I think it is. This is why I think holes are functions of spin, not math. We can talk about that too, if you want. Um, collapsing star spins like a, like a ballerina or a ice skater doing a triple act that's faster than the speed of light. Anything faster than the speed of light goes back in time. 
lot like the quantum echo theory of UFOs exactly. and stuff. Exactly. And then it goes all the way back before the beginning of time at big bangs and the space that it carried with it becomes the inflating space of the universe. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that so for, that's my, right. essentially my theory of, yeah, that's my theory of everything. The Kurt Jaimongal thing. I mean, we can talk about that later and I will say, here's the thing. Brilliant did an evaluation of all that stuff. And what they said was that the sonic gravity theory of everything may take you months to learn the physics behind the stuff that I'm talking about months maybe even years they said they said but it was original and captivating and the criteria for these videos and you want you want honorable mention for years too um you know they were like professionally it was like they want a professional you know 15 to 30 minutes mine was two and a half hours and it was me just like drawing notes and writing equations and diagramming things you know with my iphone essentially strapped to my microphone uh stand just recording so my tech was horrible it was the worst and but they were like it was captivating and or compelling and original or something that's what they said where, and where, i was floored that feedback from brilliant um there was a video that kurt put out that went through the the review of all of the um um, all of the all the ones I put it in a podcast episode. I think I put it in perspective um, when I when I talked about it. I I I put it I put it as audio kind of in one of my episodes. But cool. I was really I was really uh, uh, pleased. I I I thought they gave I thought for sure somebody would be mean, but they gave me gentle bordering on lover like treatment when they described my uh theory of everything so I, I was i was pretty pretty thankful and and really like what happened was when i figured out this anti-gravity and and i mean you can see the proof of concept in those videos that i just played of the mark one and the mark four um the proof of concept is done this is not and you can say oh no you probably put your finger on it or whatever i i don't even care it's kind of like now it's like gravity, like there's all kinds of gravity deniers, you know, maybe out there, but like gravity doesn't care, you know, you're still going to fall. You're still going to, you're still going to die from a fall. If you, you know, jump off a thing that's too high, gravity doesn't care what you believe. And it's, it's getting to the point with the theory of everything and anti-gravity that now I just don't care. I do not care who believes I'm not looking for consensus right now. I'm just looking for funding for my amp. Like yeah, I, reality, and, reality doesn't really care that much about consensus. You, you know, like no, he really it, doesn't, it doesn't, man. Its own thing. It doesn't matter what I think or what someone else thinks. Like, there is a reality. So, <laughs> and when you stop caring what other people think, yeah, you know, you're just like, dude, it's cool. Like, I understand. Not everybody's gonna get it. Not everybody's gonna agree with me. But it's just like you're just, you know, you just leave them behind. Somebody's got to get left behind, and that's when people like stop, like trying to fight you and start trying to figure it out because it's like, dude, I, I, I'm not here to convince anybody, you know? I mean, I know you see it, but, but like, you know, anybody who doesn't, it's totally cool. I don't, I don't want to change your mind. I don't care to, you know, make you think like me, you know, there's a lot of people who are not going to get it. And you know, and, and then when you start talking to real physicists and you say that, you're like, dude, look, I'm not here to convince you. Like, there's a lot of people who won't get it. I mean, you're just going to be left behind. Your time. You're wasting your energy and you're wasting your time trying to convince people that aren't even willing to listen. You know? Yeah. Like, and you just don't need to. It's like, dude, it's cool. A lot of people won't get it. You're just one of them. I get it. You know, it's like, I don't want to change your mind. And when you start talking like that, people start, they start realizing, oh, man, like, yep. they start worrying. Because it's like you, you what you you know you don't you, you don't, don't care if I don't mind. agree. Yeah. yeah. Then they don't. Then they're FOMO, right? Their fear of missing out. They don't want to be the only ones who are sitting there going, "That's not real. That's not real." And then all of a sudden, like I get my amp made, and now I turn the vag on, and the the you know the the scale just ejects it into the ceiling because it's totally massless. It's yeah. gonna be like, oh yeah, how do you like that, huh? You know, so. And it takes, you, you know, I mean, try. like I mean, you got to try, right? If you don't, if you don't try, you'll never know. And if you, if you have a vision, you go for it, you know, yeah. not, every, not everybody's going to have the same vision, 
nope, you know, like nobody will almost. Everybody has right. So you gotta you gotta feed your spirit. You gotta feed your energy. You know, like go. I, I say a hundred percent. Keep going with it. Like yeah, man. Yeah. Oh but, well. So do you do you want to play those videos and just so we've talked about sort of how I came to it, but I think the real thing is that really the thing that clarifies it is now that we've talked about how he came up with it. They got to be massless or they'd crush themselves. Um, what gives matter mass? It's the Higgs field. Um, and what is hanging on to the Higgs field? The left-handed electron is connected to the Higgs field. The Higgs field pulls on it. And so we know the left-handed electron is pushing on the Higgs field too. And then you'll see that the consensus is, is that the field strength and a vacuum expectation value of the Higgs field in the vacuum is 246 gig electron volts. I think it's negative 246 gig electron volts. That is really the only thing that is not absolutely 100% consensus physics here. That's the only thing is that I think it's negative 246 gig electron volts. And I think I'm coming out and saying that I think the Higgs field is the gravity field period. And, um, and so, and so then the next step is, okay, well, how do I get a hold of left-handed electrons? Dr. Lawrence Eves, which is the next video that, that will play, he'll say, Left-handed electrons happen when you pass a magnetic field through a hexagonal or atomic structure and they get caught in, in, the, in the electromagnetic field. Um, so now you have electromagnetic field full of left-handed electrons and now we're just going to shake it using an oscilloscope or we can use the spacing in, of spokes, uh, yep. co uh, copper spokes passing through um, magnets to give it the up, 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 up. Um, but anyway, bot uh, in the Faraday frame, um, but bottom line, that's that's how it, that's how it uh that's how it works so let's play the first this is this is once i figured out hey they must be massless what causes matter mass it took me about two months to figure out enough quantum physics by watching youtube to figure out anti-gravity and so my first step was what causes mass and this is where i learned it was from dr matt o'dowd so let me um we probably have about like five minutes left but we, so we can do um the quick sections that you're just talking about there though so i'm gonna pull up this um the higgs mechanism explained first this one yep right? yep seconds here or was there a different part yep right there that's good all right oh well, let me uh i want to make sure the sound's on let me let me, let me go back you know, one second. share sound perfect okay all right here we go field is there. But now, add some energy to that field at a particular spot, it's like plucking a guitar string. The field vibrates, and that vibration is our electron. And it's not just electrons. Every elementary particle is a vibration in its own field. And these vibrations and fields interact with each other, transferring energy, momentum, charge, etc. between particles and fields. Now, this is a very simplistic explanation of a theory that has produced an astoundingly accurate description description of the subatomic universe. Given its incredible success, it was strange that quantum field theory, as it stood in the 1950s, gave a perfect description of the electron, and yet it predicted that the electron should have no mass. The basic QFT equations of all of the components of the atom leave them massless. As we'll see in the next couple of episodes, this masslessness means that particles should travel only at the speed of light and experience no time. Their clocks should be frozen. But these particles particles are distinctly not timeless. They evolve. Take the electron. Did you want me to keep going or was that like what you wanted to show right there? No, this you haven't got there yet. You haven't okay. you're almost there. He goes, I need to tell you it, it's like in just a minute. So like you could probably edit that out. But but yeah, just if you keep going, it's, he talks about chirality of the electron. If you go. Yeah, right there, right there. Um, just start from here, though, right? Yeah, yeah, just just hit play and you can edit it to where you think makes sense. Okay. It has this type of intrinsic quantum spin that we call chirality. And this can either be clockwise or counterclockwise relative to the direction of motion. We call this left-handedness or right-handedness. Now, that spin constantly flips back and forth. The electron evolves, meaning it does experience time, so it must have mass. Also, we've weighed it. We've measured that mass directly. But a different sort of changeability is the only way that we know that the tiny 
any neutrino has mass. And it was the measurement of those neutrino oscillations that won the 2015 Nobel Prize in Physics. Now take the photon. It is definitely massless. It travels at the speed of light and it experiences its entire existence in an instant. It undergoes no internal evolution. It has spin, but the spin never flips. A photon only changes if it bumps into something else. But the photon and the electron are both just excitations in their own fields. So why does the electron have mass and the photon not? Why does the electron evolve? There are different ways to interpret it. But perhaps the simplest is to say that while the photon can cross the entire observable universe without bumping into a single thing, the electron is never not bumping into things. There's something in the substrate of space everywhere that impedes the electron. It's the Higgs field. To understand how this works, we need to come back to this spin flip thing. Here, I need to tell you about a really odd fact about the universe. It's not ambidextrous. There we go. I just didn't want to, um, I don't know if there's like a copyright thing that could happen if I don't stop it. Well, this is fair use. This is legal fair use. You're, this is explanation. Okay. This is education. But this is where it starts to get like very like, this is where it starts to really matter. This is like, this is the point where like you really want to have it. Um, and so, but this is fair use. This is PBS, which is public broadcasting. And this is for educational purposes. And so educational discussions of educational stuff is absolutely protected um, in the well, copyright laws. It's called we'll fair just let use. It, we'll just let it play then. Keep it going. Yeah. And then you can just edit out whatever you think is, uh, you know, not kosher or whatever. But no, and, I'm, I'm and this is gonna, this I'm is, probably just gonna let put all this in there, like me stopping it, us talking about it. it should be good. Yeah, sure, man. Yeah. yeah, I mean, this is what this is how I learned, right? So this is, you know, this is literally the class I took to teach myself the quantum physics that I needed to sort out anti gravity. This is literally the class. So. It actually cares whether a particle has left or right-handed chirality. See, left-handed electrons have this extra little something-something compared to right-handed electrons. It's called weak hypercharge, which, by the way, was the name of my high school garage band. It's like regular electric charge, which lets all electrons feel the electromagnetic force, except in this case, it lets only left-handed electrons feel the weak nuclear force. This cosmic asymmetry is incredibly weak weird and it's part of a mystery called parity violation. It's an open question why the universe cares which direction you're spinning. In fact, it cares so much that it won't let an electron flip from left to right unless it can ditch its weak hypercharge or flip back again unless it can pick some up. But where does this charge come from and where does it go to? You probably guessed, the Higgs field. The Higgs field is really weird. While most quantum fields hover around zero and empty space, the Higgs field has a positive strength at all points in the universe. There's a little bit of Higgsiness everywhere. In some stunning quantum weirdness, this complex multi-component field not only carries the weak hypercharge, but manages to take on all possible values of this charge simultaneously. This makes the Higgs field an infinite source and sink of weak hypercharge. Our poor electron is bombarded by a flow of particles into and out of the Higgs field from all directions giving and taking away the weak hypercharge on infinitesimally short time scale. Awesome. Um, yeah, so there, what he just told us was, was that the left-handed electron is getting held onto by the Higgs field. Now, he said that the Higgs field has a positive value. I think it's a negative value. Exactly. And that's, that's why what, I think, yeah. that's why I think if you catch you know, use, you know, the layered hexagonal um, alloy to fill that magnetic field full of uh, left-handed electrons and then shake them, you're shaking the Higgs field. And if you can drop the Higgs field to zero, everything goes massless. And so I said, I, you, in this one, I gave you the two timestamps. Do you remember what, what I said? I forget what I said. Yeah, I have um, it all right here. The first, and so, and so the purpose of this one is right is to is to talk is to show that this is why passing a magnetic struct uh, passing the the uh, electromagnetic field um through um graphene gives you the right uh 
gives you gives you what you need to essentially do anti gravity. So go to four thirty. Yeah, there you go. I'm gonna start that. Up. Yeah, there you go. And then um. Yeah, we'll start that to, one from about we'll four thirty to, to six. Yeah, we'll have to end on this one just because um, you know, I'm running out of time here. Like, I I kind of need to get going pretty soon. Okay, sure. So this will be. We'll so, we'll end on this. You know. Yeah, four thirty to six minutes, and then and then stop it and go to eleven thirty. There we go. I'm gonna do the four thirty. Starting that up. Okay talk about is um, what, a lambda, what, what are these Landau states? Well, I've said that electrons can be in free particle states. They can travel as Schrodinger waves down the crystal in a certain direction, and we can describe that. That's that hexagonal lattice of the graphene he's holding in his, in his equations. Sorry for talking over that. So that's the, that's the graphene he's holding in his hand. That's the hexagonal lattice. So go ahead and... Well, can travel freely as in graphene, but in hydrogen atoms, they're bound. So if my fist is a, a proton of hydrogen atom, then the electron can orbit around that. And then it's in a, a, a localized state. And that state now has a well-defined energy level. Whereas when electrons are moving freely, uh, depending on what their momentum is, they can have more or less any energy. They can have a small energy or a large energy, depending on their momentum. So those are states. Now, our electrons in graphene are free because the graphene is no, not is so pure. There aren't any impurities for these things to get bound to. But for technical reasons, which I hope to come back to later, when we apply a magnetic field, perpendicular to the plane of the graphene sheet, so the magnetic field is now pointing perpendicular to the plane, then the electrons undergo what are called cyclotron orbits. The electrons now move in a circular motion. And so in a sense, although we haven't got any um, other charged particle binding the electrons, we can make them orbit around the lines of magnetic field in what's called a cyclotron motion. And when we do that, uh, we bunch the energies of the states together into what are called lambda levels. Those are well spaced. They're not equally spaced in graphene. The levels actually, the more, higher up you go in energy, the levels get more closely spaced. Yep, so there you go. That's your cyclotron orbits of your left-handed electrons. And then if you, if you bring it to 1130, yeah, there, try that as strongly as possible and then the chirality effect manifests itself what's the chirality effect? ah no we come to the nub chirality is, is, is a difficult concept and even after about three years of working on graphene I still struggle with it I'm pretty I think I understand about momentum and energy conservation but chirality is much more rather more subtle it's a, a little bit analogous to the real spin of the electron the spin all electrons have an intrinsic spin they can go that way or that way and spin can be either up or down. It can be, you know, going around one way or the other. And chirality is like that. It can have two possible values: uh, positive chirality or negative chirality, if you want to call it that. I had to get my bag of winter clothes out today. It's a nice day, but I found these just to remind you that if we have a pair of gloves, then we have here a left-handed glove and a right-handed glove. And of course, it's very easy. My hand naturally fits into the right-handed glove because it's made that way. But if I want to put on a left left-handed glove, I have to struggle a bit. Now, you will make the point, I'm sure, that if the electron is moving in the lattice, how can we tell whether it's right-handed or left-handed? Well, in order to do that, we have to make a measurement, because until we make a measurement, we simply can't tell. We, it's going to be 50%, it's going to have a 50% chance of being a state like this or a state like this. So this is what we're trying to do in our experiment. We're trying to see if it's possible when the electron goes if you think of the glove as being the empty state and my hand as being the, the electron and I can either fill I can either fill this empty glove or empty state with the, my hand, which is the electron. When the electron tunnels, does, it, does a right-handed electron go into an empty right-handed state under the barrier? Of course, it can't go into a filled glove just as well. I, just if my glove is already filled with my hand. I can't put another hand in. Electrons behave in exactly the same way. They obey the Pauli exclusion principle. So I can't pile an electron into a, a state that's already filled. And so I've got to worry about conservation of handedness when 
that my electrons are tunneling and do they conserve their handedness and the long and the short of this is that remarkably yes the electrons do conserve it if we make good enough samples we can see that it affects the current passing through the device what makes them left handed or right handed well this is the, the big question uh, and it is a very subtle effect but I think we can understand it by now thinking of right handed and left handed electrons fitting into uh, left handed and right handed gloves uh, by referring back to the shape of the crystal if you if you look at the atoms here around this this hexagon focus on this uh, this uh, this particular atom you can see here we've got a bond going off here to the to uh, the left uh, along this direction uh, and then we've got these two off angle bonds going this way that's that's the case for this atom if we compare uh, the situation for the this atom for example or this atom we can see we've got a different thing the, the bond that's pointing along this direction now is going off to my right and the two angle bonds are going off in the opposite direction so clearly this atom and this little arrangement of three bonds is different from this atom and its arrangement of three bonds now the electron is moving through the lattice and although its its wavelength is much longer than the uh, lattice constant of the crystal it senses this in some way i don't want to give it sort of human properties but its motion is determined by the lattice is moving through and so this the right-handedness you can see in fact that this this arrangement of atoms is just a mirror image of this arrangement and so this left and right-handedness of the mirror image uh, is is gives rise to the chirality of the two electrons so if for example i were dealing with if the crystal lattice of graphene were a perfect square lattice uh, that would have a different symmetry and i wouldn't have this effect i wouldn't get right hand it's, so this hexagonal lattice is the origin of this uh, left and right-handedness of the electrons Very cool. So I don't know how much of that you actually want to use, but right at the end there is what he says is this hexagonal lattice is what gives us this left and right handed, you know, electrons. I'll probably just put it all in there. I think it's great. You know, people will either. Yeah. Do so, I mean, I found it cool, you know. Right. Yeah. I mean, like it's yeah. so it, it's really when you look at it, it's if you if you if you see it, if you have the right kind of perspective on it, it's easy. It's so easy, you know, you, you create a Faraday disc, you pass it through a magnetic field and then you just shake those left-handed electrons and you drop the Higgs field to the ground state. I mean, it's that simple. It's that easy. And then, so, you know, quantum propulsion, right? Like, and the reason people get burned and everything, you know, when they fly, when they see UFOs is you create this anti-gravity field, which I call a mass hole. You know, there's no mass in it and nature abhors a vacuum, right? So it's trying to push super hard you know, push stuff into it um, to, uh, you know, to fill that because nature can't deal with a vacuum. And so if you have a microwave emitter inside your craft, you put it, you know, and let's make instead of a Faraday disc that makes the whole thing a field, we'll have a Faraday hoop, right? And so the field in the inside right here, it doesn't create a magnetic field in there. And that's where your pilots are. And that's where you're working the stick, right? And so that's where you steer. And, and now if you, you know, have a microwave emitter, like, and you want to go forward, you just point, open the door, you point the microwave forward and you hit, you know, cook and it shoots microwaves out the front of your ship. Well, the universe is shoving so hard, right? It's called Casimir forces on all around you, but it's evenly all around you. So you're not going anywhere. But if you put a little something, something in the front, yep. then the universe goes, okay, well, there's a little something there. We don't have to push so hard on the front. So it's pushing harder on the back than on the front. And that's how you get that propulsion where there's no heat signatures and no thrust and no nothing. You're just shooting, you're just manipulating, essentially manipulating the quantum vacuum and making it push harder on the back. And your ship is massless now. So anytime you have any force at all on something that's totally massless, it's going light speed right away. And so, and, and you don't feel any inertia inside because the universe isn't communicating to you the sources of gravity that, you know, are all around you, which is defining your time and doing all kinds of stuff like that. And so you're essentially timeless, right? Which means now you can travel light speed, like instantly, almost light, light speed, pretty much. And you feel no inertia. It doesn't hurt you. You'll feel no time. Um, and so... And if you think about now, 
some people would go, oh, well, then we have to be nomadic, right? Because if you go 50 light years away, you come back, it's 100 years, everybody knows dead. Wrong. Because when you spin up your craft and you open that wormhole to the past, right? Say it goes 50 years into the past. Now you take a second ship, you spin that up, you fly it through that wormhole. Now you start out 50 years in the past. You can fly 25 light years out to Zeta Reticuli or wherever, kind of, you know, poke around and introduce yourself, whatever, but then fly 25 light years back and be home in time for dinner. Yep. No, See I got mean? what you're saying. Um, I think we'll have to end it here today. Um, fascinating sure. conversation. I feel like we could go for another like two hours easy. No oh, dude, problem. we haven't even started talking about these Mexican alien congressional, like, uh, you know, know. Uh, bombshells. Well, we'll have to do um, a round two soon. Yeah, my pleasure, okay. man. Thank you so much cool. for having me. Really appreciate hey, it. Thank you for blowing my mind and having me orbit through sonic gravity. <laughs> yeah, welcome. welcome. You're welcome, Alexi. Yeah. You've now viewed the universe through the eyes of a <laughs> madman. <laughs> I love it. 